Well, good morning, Walden Church. We are going to end our series with finding Jesus. That, that's a good place, right? <laughs> that's where we should finish. But I would assume that when there's lots of people trying to find rest and time and direction and joy, I think there are less people out there trying to find Jesus. Why is that? Well, there's probably a lot of reasons. I mean, first, lack of exposure. Some people may not have been exposed to apologetics or other information about Jesus. Did you know that according to the Global Commission Partners, 67% of people from Jesus' day all the way to today have never heard of Jesus? There's also prejudice. Some people have a narrow focus or a prejudice that prevents them from considering outside alternatives. And pride. Some people may be unwilling to believe in God because they want to control their lives. They don't want God to interfere. And then there's everybody's favorite, judgment. Some people may judge God's standards as taught by Jesus and the apostles as too high or too lofty or just other than their own. Suffice it to say, we are all very cynical people. We are. We all are. We, are. we are typically only concerned with our own interests, and we are very distrustful of others. This week I was looking for cynical statements, and I found a few funny ones. You tell me what you think. The first one says, if you think nobody cares about you, try missing a couple of payments. For every action, there is an equal and opposite criticism. He who hesitates is probably right. No one is listening until you make a mistake. Monday is an awful way to spend one seventh of your life. Bills travel fast through the mail twice the speed of checks. 42.7% of all statistics are made up on the spot. Two wrongs are only the beginning. Some people just have a way of seeing things that the rest of us miss. This morning, I want us to read the Gospel of John, and we're going to look at a cynic, a cynic that finds Jesus. John chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 43 to 51. And this morning's passage, I think, is very intriguing. And I believe as we read the passage, I think the Holy Spirit is going to give us insight into these scriptures that maybe we've never thought of before. Because the story is so personal and so spontaneous that it must have been a story that Nathaniel told again and again about how he found Jesus. It starts the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? you will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This morning, I do not have any points. <laughs> I don't have any points in your outline. I, I like points. I wish I had points. Points make it so much easier for everyone to follow along. But I think there's something special here that's perhaps bigger than just a handful of points. Like, have you ever noticed how random God is? I mean, even Jesus. Jesus does a lot of random things. I mean, just look at his healings. He heals by touching, raising the dead by speaking, and then he heals a blindness uh, from a man with mud. What about in your own life? I mean, really stop and think about it. God makes a perfect world. And then randomly, he turns it over to humans who he knew would mess it up. 
God chose a people to be his own. And then he totally obliterates them and sends them off into captivity. He sends his son, whom he loves, into the world. But he knew that they would reject him and kill him in the most painful way. What was in this story that we read just now? Jesus is walking down the street, and he's, what, randomly choosing disciples? These are the 12 people that are going to build the entire church. That would be like the president stopping the motorcade, you know, one day in the middle of Washington, and then pointing to some random person in the crowd and saying, you, you're going to be my secretary of defense. I mean, it seems that random sometimes, doesn't it? And this is how God operates. It looked random, at least, from where you and I were, right? But then how many of us look back at the mess of our own life and how random it looked until we got to the end? And in that process, God often looks random, sometimes painful, but you know what? In all things, the Bible promises that God is working for good to those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. But there are still a lot of people that are not trying to find Jesus. The truth is, there's a lot of atheists who do not believe there is a God, and many more agnostics who believe that there might be a God, but that he cannot possibly be known. I would probably suspect that if you're watching this right now, you don't fall into one of those two categories, but who knows? There are people like that. Who are the people? Well, there's critics, right? They believe that there is a God, but somewhere along the way, all the bad experiences of church and religion just scared them off. And they got a, a critical spirit. And having a critical spirit is a terrible thing because it closes the door to any value that you might receive or any revelation that you might need. Then there's the skeptics. These people do not believe. It's not that they have a critical spirit. Their problem isn't even that they're not intelligent, but the problem is faith. They simply don't believe that there are answers. And then there are cynics. These are people who have tried it, and it didn't work for them. They got involved in church. They got hurt. They believed in this ideal of Christianity, and somewhere along the way it got messed up for them. What's the difference between a cynic and a skeptic? Well, a skeptic never had hope, so they find it difficult to believe, whereas a cynic lost hope, and they now find it hard to believe. I love what John F. Kennedy said, the problems of the world cannot possibly be solved by skeptics or cynics whose horizons are limited by the obvious realities. We need people who can dream of things that never were. The truth is, most cynics are simply crushed romantics. The romantics are a very interesting breed. They have enough reality to know that there is truth, and they look for it, but not so much that they're limited by all the sterile boundaries of the obvious. They have an idealistic mindset, but they are looking for utopia in a church. But unless they change their minds, they'll become cynics. And then there are truth seekers. I love truth seekers because often when you find them, they're diligent, but they are also humble. And they understand the need to find meaning outside of themselves. In our passage this morning, I think we're introduced to a man who is a cynic. Now, remember what we said about cynics. They are people who have tried religion and it didn't work. They got involved in church, but they got hurt. They believed in this idea of Christianity and then somewhere along the way it got messed up for them. Let me tell you what I believe about Nathaniel and why I believe he became a cynic and how Jesus ministered to him in such a rich and powerful way that he was instantly transformed into a disciple. See, in our story, Jesus finds Philip and says, follow me. Seems random. And immediately, Philip does. And one of the first things Philip does as a follower of Christ is go to his friend, Nathaniel. Where is Nathaniel? Sitting under a tree. Philip says to him, come, we have found the Messiah. And Nathaniel responds, 
Can anything good come out of Nazareth? In this moment, I do not believe Nathaniel is being sarcastic or condescending. See, the prophecies say that the Messiah will come from Bethlehem. So the Bible says Bethlehem. His friend Philip must be wrong. Philip is not wrong. There is something that has robbed cynical people finding Jesus. There are bad beliefs out there in the world, bad theology, people who are raised and taught supposed truth or some twisted version of the truth. Bad theology will rob you of truth. You see, I believe that there had been a time when Nathaniel had been a believer, a man of faith. He was diligent. He was hungry. He had been looking for God. But somewhere along the way, that inner yearning had been disappointment, and it turned him into a cynic. And like so many Israelites, he's bound up in the sense of purpose and worth because he's a Jew. He was set apart. These are people who received the covenants from Noah and Abraham and Moses. He was of those from whom the prophets had all prophesied about the bold and the wonderful plans that God had for them. He was from the people that God had chosen that would bless the face of the earth. His tribe was meant to see favor. But instead of freedom, in his lifetime, Israel is in bondage. In fact, the God of Israel seemed to be no match for the gods of the Greeks and the Romans. Nathaniel had been raised with tremendous hope, and yet he suffers disappointment. Prophets and teachers wander through Israel proclaiming that the Messiah is coming. Meanwhile, the Jewish faith seems to be bound by Rome. Given enough time, that will wear anybody down, make anyone lose hope. Philip runs up and says, we have found the Messiah. And Nathaniel says, prove it. I've heard all the stories. I, they, don't be, I, they don't impress me. You know, I'm not going to go chase after hope again. I'm sure he had believed so much and tried so hard and hoped for so much, but now it all seems to be a, a pipe dream, not grounded in reality, out of touch with the real world. His faith had made big promises but delivered so little, spoke of many lofty things but never brought much to the table. Can I ask you something? Do you ever feel like that? Can you understand what somebody like Nathaniel must have gone through? His life disappointments that take away hope? Did you once believe so hard, so diligently, and now you just ask why? You ran so hard. Now you're not even sure what you were running for. It's not that you walked away from God. It's not that you have, well, become cynical. So here's Nathaniel. He is sitting under a tree. But I wonder if that's not also a symbol of a prophecy from the Old Testament. You see, in Zechariah 3.10, it says, In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to sit under his vine and under his fig tree. During Solomon's reign, Judah and Israel, from Dan all the way to Beersheba, they lived in safety. Every single person under his own vine and fig tree, that is an indicator of wealth and prosperity. That means life is good. And in Micah 4.4, 4, it prophesizes a time of victory and glory for those who look to God for deliverance. And the prophet says they will sit under their vine and under their fig tree. In scripture, the fig tree is a symbol of prosperity and victory and peace. So if you were yearning for those things, hoping for those things, maybe you felt you needed a little victory and peace in your life. You'd wander down the road to the old fig tree for a, for a spell. Maybe you'd sit there and meditate on the scriptures. So after Philip finds him, Nathaniel goes to Jesus, and Jesus says, I saw you sitting under the fig tree. Surprise number one. And then Jesus says, I know your heart. I know your hope. I know your pain. I know your disappointment. But Nathaniel, 
You may have been beating yourself up and been critical of your thinking, disappointed in the fact that you would not stay true to your faith. You may have even seen pain and felt regret and guilt. But Nathaniel, let me tell you what I see. I see no deceit in you. Surprise number two. His friend, his friend Philip says, come and see. Come and see. Souls are going to be redeemed. Lives are going to be transformed. Heaven is going to be opened. And Jesus echoes, you ain't seen nothing yet. But there's another Old Testament reference here. And it actually goes all the way back to Genesis. Genesis 28. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haram. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. And taking one of the stones of that place, he put it under his head and lay down and went to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up to the top of the earth, and at the top it reached heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. What if Nathaniel was thinking about this story right here when his friend ran up? What if Nathaniel was reciting this passage to himself under the fig tree? As soon as he finishes, Philip runs up and says, we have found the Lord. Because what Jesus says to Nathaniel seems so random, but maybe it wasn't. What did Jesus tell him? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This statement by Jesus, that Nathanael would see heaven opened, and the angels of God ascending and descending, is an obvious reference to Genesis 28, where Jacob sees angels ascending and descending. Now watch this. In the Genesis passage, the Lord speaks to Jacob in a dream, and he makes three promises to Jacob. First, the land on which he sleeps, the promised land, and his many descendants will have it for their own. Second, God promises that all the nations will be blessed. Among Jacob's descendants, the Savior will be born. Third, God promises his presence and fullness, and he says, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, and I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Don't those promises seem to be the very things that the Hebrew people are currently cynical about. Their land is not their own. They don't feel like a blessed nation. And where is this Messiah? His friends run up and says, Nazareth. And Nathaniel says, Nazareth? Pfft, no. But then Nathaniel meets Jesus, and Jesus says something totally random. Behold, an Israelite with whom there is no deceit. How random is that? Not random at all if Nathaniel was meditating on Jacob. Who was Jacob? The brother who tricked Esau. The brother who tricked his father into giving him the blessing. Jacob was a man of deceit. Perhaps Jesus' comment was insight into who Nathanael was, who Jesus saw. I believe Jesus was saying to Nathanael, I know your heart. I know that you have become cynical. I know how strongly you once believed and how big you once dreamed, how sure you once were, how passionate you used to be. And I know the pain and the disappointment and the hurt that you have, that all the Hebrew people have. I know it looks random and confusing. But here's the deal. I will build the great nation promised to Jacob. Although not like you expected. I am the Messiah, but not like the one you've been waiting for. Nathaniel, I'm not the Messiah you hope for. I'm infinitely greater than that. I am the Messiah that you are created for and the Messiah that you need. I believe that same Jesus says to us this morning, it's not about finding church or finding religion or finding a better way to live. 
It's about finding Jesus. When you find Jesus, you find the freedom you were looking for. When you find Jesus, you find the life that you were looking for. When you find Jesus, you find the truth that you were looking for. When you find Jesus, you find the satisfaction that you were looking for. I believe this passage is about the disciples in general, and Nathaniel in particular, coming to the realization that Jesus is the only one they have been looking for. He was the Messiah in every way they needed him to be, perhaps not in the ways they wanted him to be or believed he would be, but in every single way they needed him to be. Because Nathaniel finally finds Jesus. And here's what he discovered. It's not random at all. And so, this morning as we close, for some of us, it may look random. The pain may be real. The promise is fading. There may have been a time when we seem to believe even more faithfully, love more passionately, strive more effectively, give more freely. But the truth is, we've all become cynical. Jesus sees. Jesus knows that we need this morning to find a God who is looking for us to go to the Messiah who knows us, who sees us, and who loves us. He sees you under the fig tree. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you find us. You find us when we are lost. You find us when we are without hope. You find us when we are critical and cynical. You find us when we are hurt and broken. Thank you for looking for us, for reaching out to us and finding us. May we continue your mission to reach and find the lost. That is why we call them the lost, because they cannot find you on their own. May your church continue to be the arms and legs of the gospel. May we see with your eyes and speak with your mouth. And may we find more that need your healing touch, your love and grace. Each and every day, may we continue to advance the kingdom of God and to do your will. Amen. Hey, I just want to remind you that Walden Church is here. We are here every Sunday morning. We have two services, one at 9.30, which is our traditional service, and then we have one at 11 o'clock, which is our contemporary service. Come, feel casual, bring your kids. We have a program from birth all the way through high school, and we would love to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.